Hey, thanks so much for coming out today to um, <coughs> talk with and, and ask questions of, I think, one of the most talented and brilliant cartoonists working in, in comics today. Stop it. No, it's <laughs> for real. Uh, Ronald Wimberly, this guy is, um, as if you've seen the stuff outside, if you've, if you've read Prince of Cats and, and some of his other work, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm sure there are some people here who, who maybe are just discovering his work as part of this residency, as maybe as part of the CXC weekend. So part of what we'll do is we'll get a chance to talk about career. It's a, uh, you've been in, kind of professionally in comics now for about 10 years, right? Am I oh man, that? maybe a little more than that. A little more than that, maybe, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But not many more than that, and yet you've already got an incredibly rich, <clears throat> diverse body of work. So please join me in welcoming Ronald Wimberly. So I'm, I'm not able to pull up my notes now, but that's okay, because I know all the things I want to ask you, and I know that um, I won't get through half my questions anyway. Um, so I wanted to maybe just begin, particularly for those people who are uh, new to your work, maybe just talking a little bit about the career, and, and mm. particularly for folks who may be kind of interested in, in doing what you do, um, since you know, the, the, you're still, kind of it at the stage, I think, about to explode and go all supernova with a whole bunch of new projects coming out in the next couple of years. Nothing explodes in comics. It's very slow. <laughs> it's a very for, slow For those process. of us who are close to comics, right. it can feel like an explosion. Right. We're a slow people. Right. So it, it, it's, all, it's all relative. But I thought maybe we could just kind of start. The first time I became aware of your work, and I know there's stuff before this, because generally when people like me discover somebody, there's a already a long history of working hard. Mm. But the first time I remember seeing your work was being struck by the covers uh, that you were doing for Papa Midnight, the, oh, wow. the miniseries. <laughs> yeah. And I, not a character I much cared for, um, at least as he was first introduced. But I picked up these books in, in part because, I mean, really primarily because of your covers. Mm. Here's a couple of examples of these uh, designs, which were just terrific. Um, you did a couple other projects for Vertigo around mm. that period, but I, I, can you just tell a little bit about, you know, that's where I started paying attention mm. to your work. What came before that? Um, yeah, before that, uh, I guess I got started out when, um, uh, right after college, doing like illustration here and there, but going to the conventions, you know, yeah. um, San Diego, and I think in New York at the time was Big Apple Con. It wasn't right. like, we didn't have New York yeah. Con again yet right. um and yeah vertigo picked me up at a, in san diego and um i had already done like a a short for uh metal harlan and like uh but i didn't I hadn't written that just illustrated right. that and i did a short <clears throat> for this dark horse project that was like uh strip search they did once uh, a month they would have a contest like i guess there were four no, strips yeah like for each week, and then one, you know, would get, you know, chosen, and then they printed that at the last. I think I, I won for, I forget which month, but like, <laughs> yeah. How'd you and, how'd you get hooked up with with the French the the, the true heavy metal and had that happen? I was just I was hustling too, man. Yeah. Like I was just going to uh, conventions and taking my portfolio anywhere yeah. where they would, you know, look at it, and yeah, I checked out. I didn't really know too much about Metal Harlan at the time even, like I, I had read some Mobius and right. you know, Jacques Tardy and whatnot that I could find, but like I didn't really know the tradition of Mattel Harlan. I guess yeah. Tardy wasn't in Mattel Harlan, but like yeah. that tradition, yeah. I just knew a couple guys that were really cool, you right. know, and I'd heard of heavy metal, but you know, it was just a magazine with like porn ads in the back and yeah. stuff. <laughs> like, it was, uh, the American metallic. version was, was pretty, pretty sleazy <laughs> Metallic style. unicorn, yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, yeah, that's how I got started. And the first comic I did for Dark Horse, or did in that strip, was like, I think it set sort of a um, precedence for everything I would do. It was, it was Gratin In, which is like short for Gratuitous Ninja. Yeah, and it was which about, is still a, a yeah, handle. Yeah, still use, something right? I yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, it was about a bunch of ninjas who lived out in uh, the outer borough, like in Brooklyn. Right. And like they they went into the city, to, into Manhattan, to steal like organic seeds for like their rooftop farm. All right, I was ahead of the trend, B, cause like this was like, this was like 2000, 
three or four or something, yeah. right? Like I was way ahead of the trend on that shit. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. man, yeah. you 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 yeah. were uh, already predicting the 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 future. I had no idea. I had no yeah. idea. Um, it just seemed like, man, this is um, they commodify everything. Eventually, they're gonna commodify like organic uh, right. food, you know. And here we are. And you were in Brooklyn. Yeah, you could be a zillionaire by now. With that I know, vision. man. But here's the thing, like, you know, <laughs> you know how that how that works is there's a bunch of cats out there, you know, who are like the the front line of that stuff, yeah. you know, and like we we're terrible, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Like, you all you need is like a couple of artists that show up in your neighborhood, and it's like it's game over. Like it's it's a wrap. Got up, got up. The neighborhood's it's gone to shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's over. When did you move to? Did you move to Brooklyn from D.C.? You grew up in the D.C. Uh, area, right? D.C., um, Montgomery, and P.G. County. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I went there for from Montgomery County. I went to uh, New York in '97 for Pratt. Yeah. Oh, so, and so you, you did school at Pratt. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So never got too far out of the neighborhood. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a it's a it's a great neighborhood, and it's a it's a school that's produced a lot of great cartoonists. I heard Kirby went for a day. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them didn't. A lot of them didn't finish back in right. the old days. Uh, now he's smarter than me. He got out. Well, he got out because of the yeah. war. But like, yeah. <laughs> there and you know there was. I mean, Pratt has a commitment to comics now. Mm. At least some, right? Well, I mean, the the kids there, but not the faculty. Not the faculty still. There's like there's one guy. Um, yeah. yeah, Floyd Hughes. Yeah, he's you know he's great. He's a great artist. Um, good teacher. But yeah, so still that divide. That cause I think that's even where Dan Klaus went. Back oh yeah, he went there and did his art school right. confidential about. How was it? What was it like? I mean, this. You know, I honestly I picked it up. I was, I, Matt Johnson and Tony, Tony Atkins. I was like, cool. You know, they're Yo, taking Matt this. actually had a lot to do with some of the, um, uh, like, the semiotics in the you know the writing that he did. Yeah, was a was good for me to kind of like pick up. You know, yeah. like some of the. Um, Alegua stuff and like the little, you know, symbols. He gave me he gave me different cues to kind of like yeah. get my mind thinking about the characters. I never read the the comic yeah. before. Yeah, it wasn't much worth yeah. reading mm -hmm. to be honest. But right. you know, and, <laughs> and this was a rough character, and he was he was going in there and trying to kind of in some ways. I mean, you know, rescue a character that was kind of you know to use that horrible word, but you know, problematic mm. and. You know, bringing in a, a, a creative team that was going to try and make a different kind of origin story mm -hmm. for it. Um, and that kind of got you started doing some stuff for Vertigo. I wanted to just, before we, though, I'm going to jump out of time just for a second, because I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Like, so, you know, picking up, even though you were, you were just doing the covers on that originally, and around that same time, you, you do... A, 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 a standalone Swamp Thing story yeah, too, with, right? Yeah, uh, with Josh Dysart. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you're kind of, you know, in that Alan Moore story verse there mm -hmm. as you're getting That's started. the first time I read, I read, um, that wasn't the first time I read Moore, but that was the first time I read Swamp Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, she's it's, like he fucks a sweet potato or something. Yeah, oh like, yeah. I forget what happens. That's, like it's something crazy in it, right? No, no he no. makes a sweet potato for and his for his wifey, right? But it's hot. Yeah. It's hot stuff. Yeah, no, I've you're been on the internet. Yeah, no, yeah. it's I mean, back in my day, that was an amazing comic, but by the time you're coming up, you there was no reason to read mm. Swamp Thing, but um but you know, it's a great way to get started, right? Mm. You're picking up this this tradition. Mm. But you're also, you know, working with a, a character, and this is, you know, I know something that Matt Johnson was thinking about a lot at the time, a character who, you know, despite Alan Moore's best intentions, really, you know, kind of got a lot of things wrong, <laughs> trying to pick that up and what can you do with this, you know, this stuff made by, you know, white guys kind of creating this kind of Afro mythology based entirely on, on their own fantasies. Mm. And, and it made me think about this really recent project you were part of, uh, The Dream Another Dream. And, oh, and yeah. I, I was reminded of it because I saw your original page at, a, oh, at the right Billy on. Ireland. Mm. Um, oh, that's right. Which is gorgeous. Um, up at the exhibit for this, and yeah, I didn't know that's where it was for a while. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> I beautiful. Know, I, like, I think it's going to go back to you eventually, yeah, but you know, yeah. we're we're hanging on to it for a minute. <laughs> um, beautiful stuff, and it's. I, I mean, I got a. This got me thinking about a bunch of stuff I've seen in your work that I admire, and, and something I think that kind of comes up as a, a through line, which is. You know, when you're entering into comics, you're, you're picking up on a tradition that is deeply immersed in 
a whole lot of historical racism, right? I mean, comics have been used, uh, you know, to kind of construct and, and erect a whole bunch of ways of constructing borders and well, barriers. Well, in the West, it's like part of the craft yeah. is kind of like, yeah. it's reduction, and it's also sort of like lampooning, right. and there's humor, yeah. you know? So like going back, it really just depends on, you know, to what is the cartooning a service, right? right. In the case of like uh, kind of maintaining certain uh, like social mores and um, you know like in regard to race and gender, uh, it's definitely been at service of like some really terrible stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and some brilliant cartoonists doing right. some terrible things. Some brilliant cartoonists doing some terrible stuff. I mean, including you know the the figure of the imp in mm -hmm. Winter McKay's Little Nemo, right? This kind of mute kind of fantasy of the, the kind of African mm. um, and, and your version of it. You're not the only one who kind of picks up on making the imp kind of central to the story. Mm. Which, but you, what you did with it was just, I thought, just brilliant. Part of the reason I did it is because I wanted like the next time a uh, black cartoonist did um, Little Nemo, they wouldn't have to do it. Right, just kind of clear that out of the <laughs> you way. Know I mean? right. Like, you don't have to do it now. Right, you know what it's I mean? done. Like, and part of it, that's part of the thing too is like, um, you know, okay, we had come this far in right. the history of this, and like, I almost feel like it's an indictment of other cartoonists. Like, you get this far, we all love Nemo. Here I am, I'm like, you know, 30 something years old, it's 2014 or whatever, right. and y'all still haven't cleaned that shit up. Right. Like, it took, it took me, it took a black cartoonist getting to the point where like, they were in this circle right. to clean up the mess that like, I didn't make. Right. You know no, I mean? uh, exactly. I, I would. Mean, yeah, I would have loved to have done something else, but I was like, "Yeah, fuck what? I'm not gonna do this." And then, like, the next cartoonist is gonna get this. You know, you like, know no. this. This is something we had a, a a symposium over on Thursday and Friday up at the Billy Ireland, and it was an issue that came up. People kept bringing this up again: how African American artists and 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 cartoonists working in this medium so often have to deal with the crap that's been handed down to them by white creators. Mm that nobody's bothered to fix or even really question that much. And then there, once they suddenly realize, oh, this is kind of messed up, they, they kind of hand it off to the African-American artists and mm. say, can you make this better for us, please? We don't want to get rid of it. Right, yeah, yeah. But, you know, and, and, you know, it, and instead of giving a lot of opportunities for creating new characters, maybe. That, Heritage, not hatred. Yeah. So, I mean, the other thing, though, that blew me away with this piece, and this is the English professor in me, is, you're, you filtered us through Edgar Allan Poe, mm. and that's really just awesomely brilliant. I mean, Toni Morrison talks a lot about, she identifies Poe in particular as being at the kind of center of what she calls the um, American Africanism, this tradition of kind of white writers and thinkers using this, these fears and fantasies of this idea of Africa as a way of, of kind of constructing and preserving their own kind of white American fantasy. And Poe's pose a part of that, right, in some of his novels and, and in different ways in a lot of his tales as well. And was that kind of part of what you were thinking about when, when, going, when bringing Poe in here? Kind of, because it was, I mean, you, obviously the Imp of the Perverse was part of mm. it, um, but you, you're drawn on a wide range of stories and tales in this, and just to be clear, this piece is a master class also in oh, just it's pretty composition. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny because, I mean, I didn't even get that deep. Like, I was really sort of, um, I was uh, fixated and meditating on, like, the formal aspects yeah. of putting that piece together. So, um, like, I gave myself a problem. Uh, I wanted to, I originally had scripted something, but then I was like, okay, well, the Imp of the Perverse, like, maybe I could do something that's like a little bit of a cut up, but like not a, not a strict cut up, but yeah. you know, like break it up a little bit, put the words around a little bit. Um, I got Gloria Steinem in there too. Right. I got like, you know, a few different things. I, right. And also thinking about storytelling wise, like how um, McKay did so much, you know, experimenting in regard to like how the eye moves. Right. So I forget what you call that, where it's like, you go back and forth, like you don't necessarily, yeah. uh, you know. And you play with his his numbering because his, yeah, yeah, he you know, his he he knew he was was pushing the boundaries on what readers were prepared for in, in 1905. So he would often number his 
kind of you read this and then mm -hmm. this and then this, and you, you do some, some funky stuff with that too, kind of weaving the reader around, um, uh, around the page, kind of snake-like through, mm -hmm. the, through the page there. So, yeah, you know, I kind of, yeah, I wanted to make something that, uh, I mean, I love what you just mentioned because, like, it's, then it gets to a point where even I'm discovering something new from, like, yeah. the, the soup that I made, you know, like, the stuff that I put yeah. in there. Well, so, it, I, I mean, I, I wasn't thinking about that reading but, of it, but that's interesting. But, you know, it's, it's, it's there, right? You're taking these two figures who are... Me that, shoot me that Morrison, like, what was that, like, an essay? Uh, yeah, no, it's actually in this book she wrote, um, oh, I'm blank, I'm having a senior moment here, um, I was gonna say, in the heart of darkness, playing in the dark. Mm. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll send you the, the PDF for it. I mean, it's basically, you know, that kind of, what do you do with these figures whose influence and important is so, so you can't escape from it. You don't mm. want to escape it, but you also have this, you know, incredibly nasty baggage that comes mm. with it, that, you know, how do we remix them? And somehow bringing these two together in the way you did gives them both a chance for at least partial, you know, redemption in those mm. terms. It's really beautiful stuff. And, and it's kind of part of get what I, part of why I want to bring it up now, particularly for those of you who are new uh, to Ron's work, is that kind of remixing, including, you know, some of the, some of the detritus of the past and some of the beautiful stuff of the past and making something new out of it, mm. that's, that's a kind of big part of your work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the kind of something I see running through a whole bunch of your stuff. Were you able to, as you were getting your start as a professional back in, you know, 2005 and so, were you able to find time to do original work too or was it, hmm. was really time for hustling and finding paying work where you could? I did little, I did little, you know, projects. Like I did a little 10-page um, one called Africa, which is like, a, you know, it's like Africa with a question mark. Yeah. And it was like really inspired by, um, it was inspired by like, uh, I think at the time I was, you know, like you, you're a young dude. Like I was reading a lot of that, um, that Guy, that Guy Debord stuff. You yeah. know what I mean? And so I think I had seen some interview where I think it all got set off because, like, I probably heard like Malcolm McLaren like mention Situationist International or whatever. And I was like, oh, so I started to look that up and reading their little manuals and stuff, uh, Society of the Spectacle, and like getting into Return of So I made like, um, I was, I made like a uh, a comic that essentially was like the first, um, the first scene of Alphaville, except I, I took out like um, the elements that were strictly about, uh, say, labor or communism and you know, versus capitalism and certain other philosophical, and I put like some of uh, you know like post-colonial references, like you know uh, some um, literature more kind of about the intersection of that. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Do you, you ever send that to Godard? No, I never thought to. You should. Yeah. He, would, he would dig it's it. It's out there, yes. Yeah, yeah. the oh, hall. good. Yeah, I yeah, got to yeah. check that out. That's yeah, terrific. Yeah. Um, well, and were, you, were these the kind of things, you, would you get a chance to, to bring those to conventions? How did you get that kind of work out there at the time? Mm, oh, you know what I did that for? I did that for Meat House. They asked me oh, to cool. do a comic. Yeah, Meat House, Span of Sunset. And um, I'll probably, I've, I've been meaning to print it again because I like the character. Yeah. I think, I forget what I call him because the, the character from Alphaville is Lemmy Caution. Yeah. Uh, I call him like something else. It's like not even creatively a derivative of that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I made another one yeah. of him. And like I have some that I haven't shown yet that I would love to put like a magazine together. Oh, his, that would be awesome. His stories. Yeah, so you mean part of, I mean, you clearly, you like kind of remixing and riffing mm -hmm. off of of stuff that inspires you in different ways? Well, a lot of the things that I love um, that really inspired me, it's like, I mean, I dig, I do the research, I know yeah. where it comes from, you know right. what I mean? Plus it's like in the tradition of a lot of arts, uh, I think even black arts particularly, there's like a, a, um, a tradition of that, like yeah. going from, like, from jazz up to right. like even, you know, uh, the appropriation of um, sort of uh, Judeo-Christian elements and like mashing that up with like West African, right. you know, mythology and, and traditions as well. Like, I think it's like, I had this idea once where I was like, wow, okay, so if you, in like a group of people, and I think it, it definitely happened with black Americans, but I think it happened in other places in the world too, 
where like people get displaced and maybe a part of uh, their language or culture is eroded and then they're kind of, it's like they become almost like cult cultural isotopes, you right. know what I mean? And it's like they can, they can get and they can pull from other places to create something new yeah. to like create a wholeness, you know what I mean? So like, I think that particularly informed how I look at work. Plus it's like, I just wanna get into, I wanna get into the skin of that other thing, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I see something I really like, you know, with Prince of Cats, it's like, okay, well, you know, Romeo and Juliet was based on, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet was right. based on a prior two, you right. know? Like, yeah. Um, the he, tradition. He was remixing stuff yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he was breaking up language and doing yeah. wild stuff with language too. Yeah. So I, I mean, that was one of the formal uh, disciplines I wanted to kind of like give myself when I did Prince of Cats too. So this is, yeah, yeah, this is just something that I, I like, I feel like most artists do, you yeah. know? I, maybe some people are more deliberate or about it, you know? So I think, you know, maybe I'm a little more deliberate about it yeah, up until now. Who knows more deliberate and more kind of theoretically mm. kind of like thoughtful about what mm. you're doing. I mean, I think a lot of people, as you said, borrow things here and there and then see what they got. You, mm. But it's clear like in each of your projects, you have specific things you want to accomplish with that mm. set of ingredients. And that's, I think, part of what makes these, you know, there have been, you know, adaptations and remixes of Shakespeare, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of them, but it's a rare one in that field that really stands out the way Prince of Cats does. I mean, I wonder sometimes, man, like, because, you know, you have to be mindful. I mean, like, what, why do you, why do you set things in a different place? <laughs> I, for, I forget which one it was, but I think Kenneth Branagh did one that was like in, like, I think it was like an Edo period uh, Shakespeare. Oh, I never saw that. And yeah, I think it was just like on HBO or something, or maybe PBS. But I was like, well, why did you set it there? You know? Right. Exactly. You know, like, what was, you know, like, I see a lot of that too. Yeah. You know, exactly. it's like, there's, it's, it seems almost arbitrary. Right. And well, I think maybe there's some value to that too. I mean, I don't know what it is, but like, you know. I mean, there can be a value just to estrangement, you know, mm -hmm. to see what happens. Right. But, but okay. yeah, it's. To disassociate it from right. the original. And to let it be new for, for people. But it's. I like but, the Russian one, the Hamlet one. Yeah, that, that was one great. Was yeah. This is, I mean, I don't know if this is a project close to your heart or not, mm. but it's, it's another adaptation you were doing um, around this time in the kind of an authorized adaptation. Mm -hmm. So you had, you had Bradbury on board. This is mm -hmm. getting pretty close towards the end of his life. And he'd always kind of been interested in comics and you know, worked with some, a lot of the EC guys back mm. in the, before the code to get a lot of his stuff in comics adaptations. What was this experience like doing this? this is man, I have so many stories about this project, man. You were working with a big, with a, you know, commercial publisher. Too. Yeah, yeah, Hill and Wang, I guess. Yeah. I don't know what they were part of. Yeah, they were I don't part of something else, yeah. Macmillan, maybe, Yeah, I think, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I was really ambivalent about this project. Like, looking at the work now, I, you know, I like the, I like the work that I did. Yeah. Um, and I like what happened, but, I, you know, and I, it's like I think it's a great artifact. Like yeah, I think I um, it turned out, you know, it turned out good. But like when I first like I, this is a project where I had written an entire script beforehand, and I kind of did. I do this thing where I don't know. I didn't know. Like I really didn't think if I said what I wanted to do, that they would have said yes. So like I disappeared for a while, and I did it front to back. Um, the script because I thought like the merit based on the idea of what I did, they would, they'd be like, okay, no, nah, this is a great idea. So once they saw the whole script, they would, yeah, they yeah, would yeah. get they'd it. Be like, okay, this is yeah. a great idea. But then they were like, no, we essentially want like the Disney movie, except the comic book of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like essentially, right? Pam Greer was in that. So, but there's no Pam Greer in this. I'm sorry. Right. That's all right. Um, yeah. They put under all that. They like made her into a witch was like, that's good for her. Like, you know, yeah. She should be able to perform however she wants to perform, even. So, yeah. But it's but you're happy with at least some of what came out of it. Yeah, man, because like in the middle of doing the work, you just find the joy of just mark making and like yeah. doing, you know, uh, solving the problem of uh, design or placing. But things. the script didn't feel like yours by the time it was done. No, yeah, because it's like there were so many things that they wanted to keep. There were so many right. things that were very important to them. Like I wanted to reduce it to like, okay, well, it's about kids. They're in a, in a um, it's about like suburban decay right. kind of, right? Like yeah. the, the creepiness of 
you know, um, Which being- that, Like that page really yeah. kind of captures that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and I had ideas. Come ask me afterwards, I'll tell you like- you Just know, tell us the real dirt. I'll tell you the, actually what when, I did. When there's no cameras rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's fair enough. No, I mean, and that must have been a, a just a really different, I mean, not that Vertigo DC is a small operation, mm. but you know, that was still Karen Berger days and mm. there was some degree of autonomy. This is, this is definitely big, corporate mm. public. Yeah, no, no, no. Because, yeah, I'm getting the notes back from, I'm not talking to Bradbury, but I'm getting the notes back. You know right. what I mean? So um, there was a uh, particularly funny story. So after I changed the script, I was a little, I was a little hurt over that, right? Sure. Um, and I did this version. And I left in a sign, uh, a, a line at the end that says, like, they all dance sambo-like, you know, like once, you know, right. the kids wake up, right? I was like, yo, I'm going to put that shit in there. You going to maybe put everything yeah. else in there? I'm going to yeah, put that shit in exactly. there. Yeah, exactly. Right? And then when they got it, they were like, mm, could you take that? that? Yeah, there's, there, <laughs> there are like a few things you want to change. And then that's like at the end, right? And I'm like, yeah, no, I, I got you on all of that. That's got to stay, though. <laughs> right? Yeah. And at the same time, the whole like Huck Finn thing was happening. Right. So, um, you know, it was like Nigger Jim or something. They wanted to, what's his name? No, fuck yeah. with you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so like, um, so that happened, and I think that helped me. So I got a little like assist from Clemens, like from the, you know what I mean? From beyond the yeah, grave. Yeah, yeah, from just, beyond the grave, and we slid that right in there. I was like, okay, awesome. If I just get one thing from this, this is what I want. I was yeah. like, all right, yeah. you you need to hold that. You need right. to like, you wrote that. Exactly. You know what I mean, <laughs> and, it's, and it's you want a faithful right. authorized it's not, adaptation. It's not in the voice of a character. Right. Exactly. Like, that's your description. That's your. Though, that's right? your <laughs> Excellent. No, that's a, that's an awesome story. Um, and it was and you were, you were working that time because you're also obviously collaborating on this. I was still working book. on Prince of Cats actually at the you, same time the as same I time? did as I did um, that one. Holy yeah. cow! I was trying to just make bread, man. I was yeah. trying to like yeah, survive. Well, you're making art. That too. came out before. Four, though that I finished in 2000 um, or it launched in 2007. Oh, really? That yeah, early? Yeah, sentences. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then after, said, I think I, I caught up with that around 2010, 2011, okay. somehow. So that came out in 2007. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Pretend the slide is earlier. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, how'd this project come about? Um, a buddy of mine, like we would talk about, so at Vertigo at the time, there was this one office where um, two editors would sit, like, you know, uh, my homeboy Casey and my homeboy Pornside, right? right? So, like, Casey's Cuban. He doesn't show, though, right? And um, Pornside's from Thailand. And we would just go in there. I would talk film and hip-hop with them, you know, like, whenever I would do my rounds, right? right. This was kind of like the little, it was kind of like the little uh, ethnic portion right. of Vertigo, right? So I would go in there. You mean there I, weren't a lot of offices like that? No, no, no there no. weren't many. Right. Well, like, so we would hang out in there and we'd talk. And Casey knew I was a fan of Doom, right? Yeah. And so, and like Doom and Grimm had a record together, yeah. right? Um, so, and we built about these records all the time. And then at one point, Casey was like, yo, I have a project that I'm working on. Because Casey was friends with uh, Grimm. So he's like, yeah, you know, you should... You should work on it. And I remember at the time, there was a guy who did this hip-hop poster, like, comic hip-hop poster. And I was like, y'all need to hire that motherfucker, right? Like, but then I was like, well, um, I'll, I'll gladly take the yeah. job, though. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're, I mean, you're working with the, with the script is coming yeah, from Percy. Percy, Percy yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that was, was how much, I mean, how did that, kind of collaboration go in terms of working, you know, that's... Well, is, at the time, yeah. It's a long collaborative collaboration project. This mm -hmm. is a big book. Yeah, yeah. At the time, he was bouncing around, but, like, um, I'm in the city, so I could go up to his old neighborhood. We met a couple times. Yeah. Like, I think he was still in the city for a portion of that time. I think he would eventually move to L.A. before yeah. I finished the book. But, yeah, I would just go up to, bless you, I would just go up to the um, uh, Upper West Side where he was from and I would like, you know, take pictures and like, you know, look at the neighborhood and get an idea of what it, what it looked like now. Right. And I could go to all the locations, you know, that um, everything, where everything happened, except like the bus tour. Right. In LA, you know, so. And I mean, how, how much of the script did you get to collaborate with? Oh, you mean like writing, right? Yeah. 
Not much at Not all, much. actually. Yeah, yeah. It was more like, uh, I mean, in the same way, I don't know, like, a uh, studio, I guess a studio director would, you know what I mean? Like, every yeah. time you get stuff, maybe you you, you move something around or you sure. cut something a yeah. little bit, but, like, nothing, you know, I, I honor this text. You know I, what I mean? Yeah, no, I, yeah. and I, I mean, I feel, I love the way in which you, you kind of use the text often as, also as graphic elements mm. in the page. I mean, you kind of, this is the really, oh. really brutal, climactic scene at the beginning of the book where, um, you know, it's told kind of with the, with the, the scene of violence that leads to um, his, um, his... Yeah, he loses, his, like he can't his, walk anymore. He collapses yeah. his lungs, he describes it in detail, and as the, as the snow is falling and the, the glass is shattering, and uh, the detail of the, the shattering of the, the collapsing of the lungs, too. And you do just some terrific stuff on the page. I have a, I have a couple of pages for here, including, of course, um, you know, bring, Low finesse. Yeah, yeah. bringing in uh, <laughs> the, the feel and the rhythm of the, of the music and the energy of the time into the, you know, in, onto the page as, as visual and graphic elements. So this, this was, I take it, a, a better project to work on than than the uh, Ray Bradbury one then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a yeah. little bit. Um, yeah, no, it was, but I think I had some agency with the Ray Bradbury that I didn't have here. Yeah. In the sense that, like, uh, at least I had the um, illusion at the very beginning that I could kind of cut up this story right. of Bradbury's and do what I want to do right. with it. And even a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit more, because it's like, you know, it, I think I was starting to see like, okay, well, I can do this. And like, I'm, people trust me enough as a sort of, as a mind to be able to like put this together. Yeah. So that aspect of the Bradbury book was like very, um, even though it was difficult, that's why I say I'm ambivalent about it, yeah. but like there were some good parts to it too. Yeah. Whereas here, you're, you're telling somebody's story mm -hmm. who's, you know, who's very much with us and very articulate mm -hmm. about that story. So yeah, and there's like, it's a story where, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens in this story, yeah. you know, like that. Um, there's, like, there's a lot of incident to, like, yeah. to get through, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of incident, yeah. you know, and like, there's parts of this story that like, I knew more about than I could tell or right. show on the page. Right, just from because, conversations. Like, yeah, because like, there's ongoing you know, stuff about it. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's, uh, there's some street elements in this, in this story. Right. You know, that, um, yeah. That are still playing out. You don't want to dry snitch on nobody. <laughs> you know what I mean? Stuff like, that's still potentially yeah, to yeah, play yeah. out on mm. the streets. Right. Yeah, no, and that, did that experience of working on this project also help kind of shape some of what you were after when you turned to Prince of Cats a few years later? Well, kind of. I mean, I've always been, um, I'm not like a tough guy or anything. Like, I'm not a uh, street guy or anything like that but I you know I have you know I have friends and I have family and I think anytime you you grow up uh I mean if you grow up nowadays you probably know people you know um and kind of like I wanted yeah with Prince of Cats I've always kind of been like asking myself questions about how people make decisions and like during this time in my life I was really trying to get a handle of you know, why people do the things that they do and like what, and it formed my politics a lot, you know what right. I mean? It formed sort of like the um, double standard that we have in regard to like violence or even commerce, right. you know, um, in the United States. Like I, you know, I was working through all of that, through all of this stuff. I, mean, I think that, anyone- That we celebrate some violence and yeah. we, and we criminalize mm -hmm. others and exactly. we celebrate some commerce and we criminalize mm -hmm. others. Exactly, so I mean, that was always a part yeah, sentences, I don't know. In a weird sort of way, it's like it wasn't that deliberate. It's just like if you, you know, yeah, if you're like a, if you're a black kid, it's going to be a part of the discussion. Whether or not you're like from the middle of nowhere, people may assume they might project that onto right. you. So it's just something, I don't know, if you're mindful of the discussion. And here we are like in a nation where, you know, the criminal, you know, criminal justice is, you know, a travesty. Yeah. I mean, I don't see how you could, you, I don't know. I don't want to judge anybody who doesn't think about those things, but like, I, I mean, I, I can't help what I think about it. anybody's like, not thinking about those things now. But, but I think but, the fact that people aren't thinking about them is why we've gotten so far. Right, oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Really. I mean, it's, it's, 
I mean, one hopes that out of all the tragedies of recent months and years and decades and centuries, that finally there's a, a mainstreaming of this understanding that people are thinking about it. I mean, you hope, but. Did you see 13 yet? No. I watched part of it. I haven't, I haven't gotten all the way through it. Is that uh, DuVernay uh, film she did? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, you know, Americans are damn good at amnesia, though. So you know, <laughs> that's, where, that's where artists come in to keep us from. Oh, man, I saw something the other day. It was on um, Democracy Now. I forget the guy. He just got a book that came out. And he talked about, um, I think it was something Camus said about memory and how, like, it's, it was so poetic. And I can't remember exactly how he said it, how he said it but it was just about how important memory is for... Um, like as an adversary to like fascism right. or like, you know, oh, yeah. and the whole, you know, the whole idea of like uh, make America great again is like a, um, it's a comment on how poor our memory is as yeah. a society. You know what I mean? Because it, like, when was it great? Yeah. You it's, know? and what, what on earth do you mean by that? Right. Um, and who else talked like that? I mean, what, you know, it's like, have we, it's, it's an amazing fantasy that we all thought would go away really quickly and instead <laughs> it's he's got 45 percent of the electorate mm. it's a terrifying moment i mean it's why you know having artists like like you working in in comics like keith knight working in editorial comics is to kind of keep but you wonder history what lessons going you wonder like yeah it's history but it's also like agitprop and you right. wonder like how how well you know how how much it functions you know what i mean like how well it functions because at a certain point, it's like, yeah, you're making cartoons and like whatever, you're making a little bit of bread off of tragedy. And you're like, well, what, is, what like, are people paying attention to this? And like, yo, so is it, what is the value of sitting in a room doing a cartoon? You know, like when at a certain point, definitely your body is an important uh, thing to use, right. you know, for action. It's, you know, it's just like, it's a, it's, um, especially nowadays, it's like. Yeah, and, and cartooning is a, I mean, as any of you guys know who've ever tried to make comics, this is a, this is a slow art form, mm. right? It requires, as you said, a lot of time in a room alone, right? Mm. A lot of time not out there. And, you know, it must be a time, as you said, where you have a lot of questioning, like what, is this the, the best use of my mm -hmm. time? You know, this is my art, this is my calling, but there's also this other imperative out there, and how do you balance them? It's, these are tough issues. Actually, I'll jump ahead just for a second since you're on this topic to um, um, just a quick look at a couple of some of your political work you did, particularly kind of, um, <laughs> I, I kind of a couple pieces that I, I kind of remember. Uh, this is a more recent one. Um, and just a, uh, this is a... No, you gotta see the punchline for that. You don't have the punchline? I don't have it up here. Oh, it's just it's funny, man. So it's like, that guy is definitely like a cartoon of Eldridge Cleaver, right? Yeah. So it's like, <clears throat> his sister in the back, like, you know, supporting this guy, right? You know what I mean? Like, talking about the, you know, justice system, how broken yeah. it is, and like, you know, we can't get any, we can't get justice, right? Yeah. And then like, you know, she's on her phone, like, oh. She's on her phone later, and she's like, um, she's looking at like a Bill Cosby, you know, things like I can't believe this guy, you know, like he's done all of this shit or whatever, and like this fucking gross, nasty guy, and then and then the Eldridge Cleaver guy's like innocent until proven guilty, right? <laughs> whatever happened to innocent? Yeah. And it's like a type of fucking, you know, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, and it's you know a reminder of the incredible blind spots of mm. the 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 movements. Uh, of the, the late 60s and 70s mm. that, you know, Eldridge Cleaver came out of, particularly with relationship to women and rape culture. And, you know, that ultimately it's going to be the, the young people who are going to kind of get us. You know, forward. so many people read that cartoon or a few people read that cartoon that, like, didn't even get the punchline. Like, they didn't even, because it's so embedded in how we think about right. it. They're like, they thought my point was Eldridge Cleaver's point. Or, like, wow. you know, that guy. And I was like, wow, you know? And it was, it was really sad because of the people who thought that were the people for whom I drew the comic, you know what I mean, to be an ally. They're like right. so used to maybe being 
left out of that conversation. That they didn't even like, assume that they you were an assume, ally. That they didn't even assume that I meant right. to like, sort of like how ridiculous that yeah. is. You know what I mean? Humor's hard. I mean, political humor <laughs> is hard. Full stop. Humor's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard stuff. Um, but I, yeah, it worked for me. It's, uh, and this is a piece you did for the Occupy anthology. Yeah, yeah, the Occ Occupy comics, whatever. Is that the first Occupy. time? That's the first time I saw that, the, the long nose. Oh, the Tengu guy? Yeah, yeah he's a character in uh, Gratman. I don't know if he's in like the um, Tangerine, like the one I mentioned before. But he's in some, I mean, they just show up. These characters I just always draw. Like yeah. they don't, um, they're often a way for me to experiment on things like ideas and formats. This maybe is the first um, Yonkoma comic I've done. It was like Kisho Tenketsu, yeah. like it's a, yeah, so um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's about them like stealing electricity from like down, right. when they had the floods. Right. Uh, downtown, like I guess around Wall Street, they had generators up. Yeah. And meanwhile, like the rest of like. Uh, of yeah. Downtown and the boroughs are in yeah. darkness. Yeah, and it's uh, and, and I you know I always think about uh, kind of when I was reading that I was thinking about the beginning of Invisible Man and his mm. billions of lights in his basement that mm. he's been taken off of the off of the grid and uh, the the kind of I love that like yeah. you seen the photos that yeah, um, yeah. what's his name did, uh, uh, I can't remember his name his I was, son did Superfly he did yeah. Shaft yeah and and they're just gorgeous who knows who knows. Who's, who's got who's the got director a, of Shaft? Okay. Ben, you got a computer? Hmm? Peoples. Yeah, no, Melvin Van Peoples, Peoples did Shaft like three or four years ago. I'm talking about like 1971 or something. No, that was. Hmm? Gordon Parks. Gordon yeah. Parks. His son did Superfly, 69. Yeah. Gordon Parks did those photos, and they're yeah. amazing. If you've seen if if you haven't seen them, check them out. Gordon Parks. Invisible Man. When I photos. first saw those photos, I thought there was going to be a movie. I was like, Yeah, oh, no. that would have been insane. It but they say you can't film it. I don't think it's filmable. Yeah. I had a student once try and write a screenplay of it, and it didn't work. That the first, do. the short at the beginning. Yeah. That has been very yeah. influential yeah. on me. You know, I mean, that's you know, it's got its issues too. Sure. But like, oh um, yeah, man, like, you know, just thinking about using or like delving into the psychology of all of the issues we have here in America. Like, and doing it the way, you know, uh, that, yeah, that was really influential yeah. on me. And they think about what Ellison's doing there with, you know, both, you know, obviously indicting American racism, but also, you know, it's a hard thing to do, kind of criticizing certain elements of the left that were, mm -hmm. you know, kind of using black bodies for mm -hmm. their own gain and, you know, also bringing in American literature. It's like and Iffy it's Hollers is kind of like that too. Yeah. Iffy Hollers, you know, like yeah, the one where exactly. got, a, got a bit of that. That stuff is crazy. Like I heard this really great critique of it though that I felt um, maybe it's not fair, but uh, between the world and me, like the long tradition and even Baldwin, like, like the long tradition yeah. of particularly black male intellectuals like appealing to white people like right. to recognize their humanity. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, it's tiresome to read it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, even though it's brilliant, sometimes it's like, fuck, B. Like, yeah. they're never going to, free. like, it doesn't yeah. matter how, you know, you, like yeah. the most brilliant pieces of literature. And it's yeah. like, often, so, you know, oftentimes in those narratives, like leaving women behind too. You know, like yeah. the tradition of that is like, you know, it's fraught. So like to be, like, that's something I think about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. It's, and it's, it's, I mean, these are themes that seem to be kind of issues and thinking that seems to be informing a lot of your more recent political work, too. Are you doing other political, more kind of, uh, I mean, a lot, there's politics in all your yeah, work, yeah. but That's more kind of explicitly political work, um, more kind of activist work? You know, like, I think if I do um, much more of that sort of thing, I got a homie who, like, she's a civil lawyer, and I'll talk to her, like, I try to be, t service to her like right. whenever she needs me but like I don't I don't know man like uh, it's a great question because outside of the definite political uh, aspects of my work I don't know man like 
drawing a cartoon just seems like that's where that quote comes from in the hallway. Yeah. Like they asked me to do something after like, I don't know which person got shot. And I was like, well, by the police. Yeah. Murdered. Yep. Um, executed in the street. Yep. Right. Um, I was just like, B, like, why, you know, why am I going to draw a, a cartoon? Like, and for what, man? Like, so you can have, like, for someone to look at, you know what I mean? Like a cartoon, at what point, you know, is this, you know what I mean? Right, and that's, yeah, that's part of what I was thinking about even with your, your imp piece in mm -hmm. uh, the Nemo thing. And I, again, I love that. I mean, mm -hmm. but the, the issue that you raised and that I was thinking about, it was like, it came up in the symposium. To what degree can we use this medium that has been all about, kind of premised on the language, a visual language of, of stereotype, of, of distillation, of reading people as kind of iconic signs. Mm. To what degree can that form undo mm. centuries of this? this I show? think, yeah, I mean, what I try to do with that, um, the uh, different world piece, the Bill Cosby one, yeah. was like, if there, there's a way to kind of reconcile that like uh, dissonance, you know what I mean? Maybe that, that has some value. Yeah. Um, I think I've seen a lot of cartoons, cartoonists um, do, like they, they present information well, and I think that's great. Yeah. I think as something I haven't really uh, tried to do, just in terms of like infographics. Right. I think I love those, you know, that's yeah. kind of a, a form of cartooning. Oh, it is, absolutely. Yeah, I, I love that because it's like just putting the information out there for people to see. Especially for um, a generation that's so visually literate. That, mm -hmm sucks up information visually in a way that my generation didn't. Mm. And you, you do that. I mean, even you know, your ability to, as a designer, to get a whole lot of narrative information in there visually is, mm. you could do that stuff. Yeah, no, you got I enough think on I your can. plate. Yeah, we gotta yeah, talk no, no, about no. some of that. Before we turn towards talking about um, kind of the kind of recent work and upcoming projects, and I swing him by there, I was by the image booth. Uh, my old friend Stang was there and he mm. said, you have tons of stuff coming up. So he was, Yeah, no, nah, it's, like, it's crazy. Why am I even here right now? Should exactly, be, <laughs> you should be working. Chained to my desk. <laughs> but I wanted, to, I wanted to make sure we do talk about Prince of Cats a bit more just before we let it go, because it's, you know, this is, this is uh, I think for a lot of people who are, you know, they're saying, you gotta, you gotta read, check out Ronald Wimberly's stuff. This is the book they hand to people, right? If they can find it, it was out of print right, for a while. Yeah. Fortunately, you've got it, wrestled it back in print. Um, and speaking of which, do you have any copies left for sale? Um, there are some, yeah, we're gonna, be ha we're gonna have some copies out here. I'll be signing awesome. after the... Yeah, yeah. Excellent, sorry, that was a more selfish yeah. question. But <laughs> let's, get, let's get back to the, because uh, uh, I'm excited to have it back in print. It's, this is, for those of you guys who don't know it, it, it is a, um, uh, a kind of reimagining of uh, Romeo and Juliet. I like to call it it's the B-sides. The B-sides. I mean, and, you know, again, just like with, with, uh, with McKay and Little Nemo, Imp is at the center of the story. Mm. Here it's Tybalt is at the center of the story. Mm. It's, this is the, you know, the guy who's kind of cool, but he's, you know, it's... He's kind of cool, but he's hot. Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. hot-headed. He's, he's you, know, you know it's not going to end well for him. Not that it ends well for anybody, but right. <laughs> um, it's, it's going to end badly for him and nobody's going to care, uh, yeah. unlike the other ones. There's who are gonna so much about. Shakespeare and what's going on right now. Uh, like, no. There's so many ways you could have went. And, it's, and of course, it's, it's, um, you know, it's set in, uh, in, in New York and it's got samurai swords. Yeah. So like it's, it's awesome in, in every way and it's just a master class of Nobody visual talks about the Kopesh. Now. Everyone, like, I guess the main character uses like a katana. But like, yeah, there are lots of different, uh, yeah. there are lots of different. There these are lots guys, of good weapons. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and great armor too. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, uh, it, it's, it's beautiful stuff. And um, just again, I mean, some of, the, some of the quote unquote silent pages, the pages without dialogue, um, really ni work nicely up here. The, the script is amazing. It's, it's Shakespeare, but lots of other, influences too coming out of hip hop and, and, and poetry and, and out of your literary imagination. But these pages work nicely on the big screen, just showing off the, the, the sound effects, the rhythms, what am I doing? the violence. Um, uh, it's, it's like Frank Miller, if he could tell a story. 
Um, oh. oh, that's not gonna. That's not on tape, right? Edit savage. That, edit. Um, Jared, savage, y'all. Uh, um, wow. It, so, no I mean, this is this was a, this was clearly a labor of love project, mm. right? I mean, this was. Yeah. The I job. was pitching that when, like, right as we closed up sentences, I was already pitching yeah. that to them. Yeah, was yeah. it hard to sell, or did they? Um, I mean, I, mean I, I was gonna ask if I they got it, but they clearly never really got it because yeah. they didn't take good care of the book. That's mm -hmm. for sure. You know, hard sell, man. One of the things is I'm appreciative is like as irreverent and like kind of just lackadaisical I've been about comics in general. Like I can't say it was a hard sell because I did it. Right. I've seen so many people who try so hard to get their ideas made, and like they just don't get any love. Yeah. So like I can't say anything I've done has been like that difficult you know what right. I mean like I mean work is work but like I've been very fortunate yeah. um I I feel like comics is weird it's like um comics if it were a person it'd be like a person who just likes you when you when you don't give it enough attention or like you know it's like kind of a weird you know what yeah. I mean Oh, I'm off and I'm doing something else. Oh, why don't you come over now and like, you know, <laughs> play. And then as soon know, as you're back, yeah. it's like, uh, exactly. you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like, when, once you start to give it the attention, it's like, oh, they start to treat you some type yeah. of way again, right? That's how comics has been. Like, so I, I finished this job and I was like starving. I was trying to do uh, sentences. I was trying to do whatever the hell I could do to make some money. Uh, a friend at the time like gave me an opportunity to um, be in uh, an extra in a movie, right? And that yeah. took me to like it took me to Tuscany. So I'm over cool. in Tuscany playing like with you know M1 Garands like a Buffalo Soldier thing, you know. And then like um, I'm out there, and it's been like maybe a year or a year and a half. I had already started to like finalize a deal with someone else to do Prince of Cats. And then comes back Vertigo with like, you know, money, Suddenly they in, money you. in their hands, right? You know, awesome. yeah. Like, why? Why would would you want to do it with us though? Right. I was like, no, nah, but I want your money though. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I did it, yeah. you know. And it was kind of like a when you dance with the devil, right? Yeah. So I never, I mean, I never understood that they. I mean, the book did well for them. It sold yeah. out really fast, and then they just. That's what you would think, right? They seem to let it go. No, nah, but you know. Did they just not know how to market it? Uh, I mean, it was kind of what people were looking for it almost immediately. Like, yeah. where do you get it? Oh, it's already gone. It's I don't know, man. Like, I, you know, if I, you know, I start asking those questions, I start to come up with answers that I don't want to like. That you don't want to yeah, think, think about. Yeah, I don't think about. Yeah, yeah. So how'd you get it back? Um, it was just, I think they were shedding a bunch of properties. Yeah. You know what I mean? On, uh, yeah, uh, I think, they were doing that move from right. uh, New York to where is it? Burbank? Right. And uh, yeah, I just kept asking. I was yeah. always asking him about it because like it had literally been out of print from like the year it came yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. You know? So after two years, I think it goes into like, I don't know, deliberation or something. They got another yeah. word for it. Right. And I was talking to my agent and my agent at the time, Bob Mikoy, like he really helped a lot awesome. to get it back. Like he stayed on him and then I got it back, man. Yeah. And now it's and it's 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 going to be out November first, I yeah, think. Yeah, I believe so. Um, in stores and uh, in a beautiful new edition. I really, it looks gorgeous. Thank I have you. and you have here. Uh, uh, do you still have your special editions? Yeah, I, ha I mean, I sold. I just sold too many, man. Like, not I can't, that I'm asking for a friend. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Okay, yeah, yeah. Also, that's the size it needs yeah. too. It was too small in the original. And so, did, did you do anything like in, in terms of as you were getting a chance to work with it again? Did mm. you do anything with colors? Yeah, or so anything? I don't know if you, you saw in sentences there were like uh, sound effects and stuff. Yeah. Like right here, I think this ha ha ha. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I changed the titles. Um, so I, I wanted to make something more cohesive. Originally, like I didn't do design on the book. Like Jared did a great job on some of them, but I wanted something a little bit more understated. Right. And like here, the ha ha ha, I think was. Uh, digital, you know, like right. vector. I didn't want that. So I went back and I changed all of the sort of um, sound effects into, I put hand-drawn sound effects on it. Oh, cool. Yeah, that Chaka Chaka was there though, before. Yeah, and then the, and the, the original colors were great on that. Yeah, so thing. see, this is the original. Um, this is like, if you turn to the Tybalt section, the yeah. type is different. 
This is from the first edition. Yeah, this is yeah. all from the first edition here mm -hmm. that I got up here. Yeah, no, and it's um, uh, I, I'm really excited and, and just to have it back in print and and have image. So you've mm -hmm. been kind of images, kind of something of a, a home mm -hmm. for you now. It's my new dancing partner. Yeah, it's now. that's yeah. a good dancing partner mm -hmm. to have. I mean, they're I know they're excited about. Well, I got a lot um, of cool peoples over there that yeah. I like. So yeah. I mean, I like to be a squad. You know, like yeah, got yeah Keating in there, yeah. Kelly Sue. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, Brandon is over there. So yeah. and, and they are, I mean, and you know, they they believe in the creator, mm -hmm. and you know, creator rights, and that's, you know, other places like Vertigo were supposed to do that, but it never quite, mm -hmm. never quite realized that dream. So, I mean, it's tell us a little bit about some of the projects you have coming up, because mm -hmm. I know you got two or three books in that. Yeah, two years. I, you know, I'm reluctant to talk too much, but like uh, I've already let the cat out of the bag. So well, they're they're it. talking about it, so you yeah. might as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sunset Park, which is like, you know, yeah, you can keep, like, like I, you know, I'm working on it. <laughs> but it's um, <clears throat> six part, uh, um, sh and like not shorts, but like graphic novellas, I guess you would call mm -hmm. them. Romantic, uh, romantic horror, um, contemporary, mostly contemporary romantic horror. So um, it's crazy because uh, when I first, I first pitched this before I did, I forget when that Dark Horse Presents came out, but I was, um, I was pitching it to someone over at Dark Horse and like it evolved over the years. Um, and about, I think it was two years ago, you know, still pitching it and pitching it, uh, Joyce Carol Oates came out with Accursed and I was like, wow, okay. And I felt like, okay, now I even have like a counterpoint, you know, like not a counterpoint, but like, okay, I'm going to make a work in comics. Like, you know, she's on that shit. I'm on that shit. Right. Like we're on that shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, she has a great anthology of Gothic stuff. Oh yeah. It, yeah. Okay, really nice gotcha. collection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it deals with some of the, um, contemporary issues in the same way that say like, uh, Dracula was a, um, uh, what do they call it? Like, uh, like, not immigration fiction. I forget what they call it. Yeah, it's, it yeah. was it was certainly plugged into Bram Stoker's own ambivalence about his yeah. own status as an immigrant and mm -hmm. and his own xenophobia at the same time. Mm -hmm. like, you know, self-hating immigrant narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. You don't got the self-hating part going uh, on. There. I mean, I I mean, internalized racism is real, man. You no, gotta fight it or else you'll drown yeah. in it. Um, you gotta acknowledge it. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Is it, set, is it set in Sunset Park, the neighborhood? Yeah. 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 Well, it's set in New York, but yeah. like a, a good portion takes place in Sunset yeah. Park. Um, uh, yeah. So it deals with a lot of things. Yeah. If, you know, without saying too much, like, yeah, it deals with some uh, issues through that, that medium of horror. And it's epistolary. So, yeah. Epistolary? Yeah. Well, that's one of the problems I gave awesome. myself was to create. In like in comics, like comic. how do I do that? You know, that's so like, fabulous. Yeah, and of course, Dracula is epistolary too, mm -hmm. um, and some of the best early Gothic is. Mm. That's fabulous. But I figure, like, if you're gonna go, I mean, it's the same with Prince of Cats, right? Yeah. Like, so if I'm gonna do Shakespeare, like Shakespeare was a sonnet, then you know, or Romeo and Juliet right. was a sonnet, right. you know, or had was full of sonnets, full of sonnets yeah. 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 Um, and full of like, uh, you know, certain types of language. I mean, this isn't going to be in like, you know, Victorian English, like, but it's, you know, but I wanted to, I wanted to, um, for me, part of my process is giving myself uh, things that reflect the subject formalistically that I'm working with in the comic. So the epistolary part was an important part for me That's terrific. to, um, and there are other elements like that too, but it's like, I'm wrestling with And it's that could be the first of the new projects at Image? That's the first, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after that, the other one that people will ask me about that I don't like to talk about because like I need to focus on like- One at a time. Yeah, yeah, one at a time. But one like, at a time. I, you know, I, I compile my, uh, my reading and you know, I do, I've discovered that like, I don't know if I'm like a heavy researcher because I, I did a panel with this woman, I forget her name, and I forget what the book was, but I remember what she said in regard to her research. And I was like, wow, you really put in work. 
and I do put in work though yeah. too. That comes and I, through. Yeah, I mean, it's like, but it's it's also kind of like, um, it, sometimes I wonder if comics can sustain that amount of research or even someone who's just fucking off and like not doing anything but like what if they have to do that to create some art right it's like nowadays you have like twitter you have like short articles but it's like do you have you know does sort of advanced capitalism allow for you know these other types of works like could someone make like the great novels that come out now it's like you need some sort of a backing you need to be uh um, connected to something that is going to sustain that. And right. sometimes that shapes the type of works that get made. Sure. Yeah. You know, the deeper works that are sustained by things like they probably have some sort of connection to uh, corporate backing or like... You or know, even big arts funding. Yeah, big arts funding. Comes, comes with its own lenses that start right. shaping the way you see the world. Exactly. When you know that's where the money's mm -hmm. that's keeping you going comes from. Yeah. Comics doesn't have, well, got a couple of MacArthur's mm -hmm. out there, but that's not something most cartoonists are going to be counting on. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of corporate backing. There's not a lot of big arts funding. So it's, as you said, it's, you know, to do the kind of research and labor that cartoonists like you do, it's, it's costly. Can you imagine if the money that goes into, like, speaking of, like, the undead, yeah reanimating these like corporate spandex cartoon characters every year went like just even a portion of that went into like you know if the, even if there's a tax just tax yeah. on like yeah. you know two <laughs> percent of their tax. revenue right yeah, yeah. that's spandex tax exactly yeah. if, if this is only thing that hollywood's going to make from now on there mm. should be a tax for right. the for the for the other arts um no that's exciting very excited to i'm also just excited that you're in a place where you can where you can do your own thing. You could do any collaboration, collaboration projects or mostly going to be doing your own stuff for a while? Well, I'm working on it, but Sunset Park is going to have some collaboration in it. Like, uh, not on the drawing end, but like, yeah, I'm, I'm, wanna have, I'm having some backup strips. Yeah. Oh, terrific. I'm having some of my friends along. Oh, excellent. Yeah. That's great. So. I, before I open up the questions, I want to make sure we at least get a chance to, this may be, um, you know, probably one of the best. Well, that's weird, right? One of the best read, <laughs> one of the best read viral comic essays. I mean, visual essays uh, I can think of in the last couple of years. Um, a lot of people uh, may have who don't read comics regularly may have first heard of you from uh, this essay, which is just a, a masterpiece. Really, uh, a lot of us have brought it into our classrooms, um, and uh, it's uh, I think a great way. I mean, you talked about infographics, mm. right? great way of raising some serious issues that particularly you know in for uh kind of white editors who clearly you know take for granted um their the fact that they don't have a uh a hexadecimal id mm -hmm. um and uh, uh that the world is just black and you know the race that need not name itself. Uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a clinic, right? You really, you do, you, you, you were teaching and preaching here. Yeah, I can, went off. Can you, you went off, but it's so smart. Can I you, mean, you just talk a little bit about, for those people who haven't read it, about the, the context of this piece? I, I didn't know way to It's funny because it. in the end, at the end of the day, it seems like so silly that there was such, like it even got to that point. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, right. um, it was just, and it's, it wasn't the first time I had been asked to lighten the skin tone of a character, but it was the first, it was the last time, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will be doing that again, I guarantee yeah. it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, it's, you know, it's kind of like, sometimes you look and you're like, okay, well, that's going to print funny. Like, the, um, uh, some of the covers for Papa Midnight, it's like, I went dark, and I actually just went, I kept dark, because I was like, well, it's just going to be a dark character. Like, right. uh, just off general principle. Um, but I could understand that. In this case, it was like, I think it was kind of the little dialogue we had back and forth where um, I said, she said, oh, could you lighten the character? And I was like, oh, well, in this, you know, I, I looked on the Marvel, whatever the thing, they have like a little wiki. I was like, oh, well, it says that she's like uh, uh, Mexican and black, which like to me is a ridiculous thing anyway, right? Like uh, just the, you know, that could mean that both of her parents were Mexican. Right. Or like, ooh, Sorry. that was an interesting Keep noise. talking. Yeah, so, um, 
And then she replied back, like, no, they're Latina and white. And I was like, all right, so, but essentially, like, <laughs> you just described, like, someone's, you know, cultural heritage, like, the language they speak, and, like, oh, they're kind of, like, ooh, <laughs> designation within, like, you know, racial construct. And, I mean, I didn't say that to her, but, like, at that point, you know, my mind is just, like, spinning. And I'm like, well, the, the short story is I'm just, like, I'm not, I'm re- not going to do it anyway, you know. Right. And you're not going to say anything because, right. like, it's you don't even realize what you're doing. You're not right. thinking about it. You know, like, I, and, um, yeah, it was just ridiculous. So, and then from there, I, I, um, I'm talking to the nib. And uh, they wanted work from me, and like I had talked to Matt, I told Matt the story before, and he's Matt like, Matt Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's like, yo, we should do it. And then I, I kind of went straight forward with it, and I didn't want to put a representation of myself in the comic, but Matt was like, yeah, we want you should put yourself in the comic. And then from that, trying to solve that problem, I kind of started to get into the hex code thing. Right. And um, that having that one problem gave me the formal constraint that made the whole thing. Yeah, no, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable meditation on, on race, on race and pop culture, on race as it's also filtered through the corporate culture, mm. um, which only really cares uh, about one color, um, mm. but... Um, She-Hulk. She-Hulk, exactly. <laughs> Um, but uh, is very invested in maintaining, as you, as you point out, these, these racial constructs as, as meaningful, as something that, you know, actually they can um, kind of use to kind of brand their, their characters and, and market them in mm. certain ways and make sure they sell well in global markets. Yeah, um, because, I mean, but it's also, it's very personal. It's like, what, yeah. you know, what do you think about yourself even to like right. ask that of somebody, right. right? And like what, and how, and how did you get to that point to ask that without like, you know, you didn't think about, like you didn't, it's like you, you obviously don't know me very well. Like, and right. why would you even, like, why would you say that to someone? Why would you say that to a, why would you say that to a person of color anyway? Right. You know, like why, why would you say it, period? You know, it just, it, it, it's not that there's something malicious in, in the intent. Right. You know, but it's, it's kind of like, I wanted to just put it out there so that people would think about it because it's obviously something that happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. You know, and like, think about it, B. Like, I made Apocalypse, like, purple. He's supposed to be blue. You didn't say shit about that. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I did, you know what I mean? Like, I did yeah. She-Hulk, like, four, five. I mean, we're not even going to get into She-Hulk. But, like, right. we, I did, I, I did, you know, like, four or five different flavors. You know what I mean? Right. She's walking through the light. You know, she's different colors. Right. You know? She's in the like shadow. Like all of us, yeah. You know what I mean? Like. Right. So the idea, it, it's nuts. Like on a few of these, like you'll see, um, I do, um, I think I have my face and like there's light on one side and there's, yeah. you know, there's a shadow on the other. And I think it's like two different hex codes. And it's like, that alone is crazy. Like you're an editor and like, and it also starts to make me, you know, not to get off on some other shit, but it makes me start to think about like, well, what are the qualifications to be in this position of power? Right. Like a gatekeeper who essentially picks artists, you know, uh, um, keeps this brand like so right. what qualifications do you need like what level of sort of uh social intelligence do right. you need you know to to do this type of job and it's like wow it's terrifying and what kind of blindnesses do you need right the, and in a, the as you said the ability not to think mm. is its own kind of dangerous mm. power right the mm-hmm. ability not to say wait holy shit what am i asking you mm. that's that's a dangerous power in mm. the hands of people of in, in those positions of power mm. and part of often how they get there. And, you know, Marvel's, of course, branding itself now in terms of, mm. you know, all new, all different. Um, and, you know, in part, uh, you know, one likes to imagine they've kind of listened to some of the criticisms that they and DC have received mm. and are trying to respond to it, mm. maybe even doing some soul searching. But you also wonder how much of it is just. Mm. Well, I mean, marketing. that's the thing, too. It's not a monolith, right? Right. So, like, none of these big corporations are a monolith right. in as much as they're made up of people with different motivations, Good. like, even yeah. in the board, right? So I talk to my homies sometimes about this, like, the way sort of, like, maybe even corporate power works, where, okay, 
So everybody in the room has something different they care about. Maybe even they have things that are like first and foremost like more important to them. Maybe there's a person in there who really cares more about like uh, the earth, like you know, global warming. That's like their main, right. their main thing. Secondary, like this business needs to make money. You got someone else who's like, oh, like civil justice, main, main thing that they, they're concerned. Second thing though is like money, right? right? And then you go across the board like that, gender, you know, gender equality. Right. Second thing, though, is money, money. right? So right. in that scenario, um, when there's time for that, for that beast to move, like, it's going to go, it's money. It's money, because that's the one thing they that's all have the in common. That's the one thing they yeah. all have in common, that's, you know? That's brilliant. And, right. I, and, in a, and in a corporation like that, too, it's like, it's like a bunch of people with jobs. Yeah. Like, the one thing they want is that check, man. Like, right. you don't, you know, like. And, and the promotion. Yeah, and a promotion. It's like at the end of the day, you just need to, you need to maintain. And I'm not mad at that at all. And I understand that there's, it's difficult. And there, I've met a lot of people working in these businesses and these corporations who are really great people. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's like how do you hold that corporation accountable? And, how, and who has the reins to kind of be like, okay, we're going to really do something with this? I think it's changing the culture inside, you know. And I right. think, uh, you know... Um, to, I can't even say to, I'm about to sit up here and lie. I just, I think they need to hire more people and not just like hyper visible black people who have, you know, who are like just their presence is sort of a rebuttal to the criticism. Who have a column in the Atlantic, yeah, for example. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just as an example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, actual... I mean, hypothetically. Actual, wor actual <laughs> working artists and writers. Right, right, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. They, I want to make sure there's some time for questions before people get a chance to go out and see the show. Um, and, any questions from the audience that people want to... I, I wore the wrong shirt, though. There we go. Okay, I'm just curious. Like, you've talked about, like... Um, like the, the glorification of violence, and mm -hmm. then like, how do you like, with with the beautiful work like uh, Prince of Cats, like at the, in the intro, like that. How do you rectify the enjoyment of like the, the this beautiful martial like yeah. execution of of like these techniques, you know, the katanas, mm -hmm. all these weapons. Um, but how do you rectify that with not glorifying violence? Mm. No, I think about that all the time, man. Like, one of my favorite genres is, like, chambara, right? Like, it's like Zatoichi and shit. Um, I don't know, man. I, like, to keep it, to be perfectly honest, I don't know if I do avoid it. You know, like, violence is, and, like, the, the, um, the, like, the will to violence, like, such a part of being human, it's terrible. I think um, maybe giving, uh, giving the characters realistic, uh, ramifications and I, in some cases like showing uh, showing like the um, yeah you can show the spectacle but maybe also showing like what happens when when that you know like the the real yeah. or hyper real or you know um, ramifications of that violence you know what I mean so I think when you when you look at say a lot of action adventure and you got all these like bodies falling into water or like you know disappearing you know what i mean like almost in a video game where they like flash for three seconds and they disappear and they respawn and they come back onto <laughs> the you know i think like in history like i mean people not a lot of people don't like this one but like the cronenberg history of violence right like he did this thing where like i always think about this where this character just like destroys all these people and it's like wow that's cool and then he just like lets the camera just go over like yeah you know, what happened, you know? So like in this, in Prince of Cats, like there's a scene that's kind of like that, the police yeah. come into the, um, the, uh, the dance hall and like Tybalt jumps out of the window, right? And he's not like, just like, oh yeah, I just kicks somebody's ass, he fucking pukes, you know what I mean? Because right. he just did something disgusting, right? He did something terrible. Like he had been to school to learn how to use this sword, right? He's like, uh, you know, I forget, I think Mercutio says he could like, prick the button off right. of, you know, a lapel. He's so good, right? He's that nice, but he didn't actually know he was that nice. And then he, he did all of those terrible things. And then he's just kind of like, you know, he's human, right? He just did something disgusting, right? And I don't, like, I thought about it, like, I don't know if I had to defend myself or, like, if I was even trying to, like, you know, 
if I was gassed and I was like, yo, I'm gonna fuck these people up. Like, what if I did go out and did fuck them up? Like, that'd probably be terrifying to me, you know? So, like, I wanted to capture some of that. Mercutio is a, is a little bit of a, um, what do they call it, like, chaotic neutral. Yeah. So, like, he, you know, for him, it's, you know, it's play. You know, like, it, it's, he's more formalistically interested. He's in, interested in, like, what he's learned and what he can do. And, like, he's probably more interested in, like, killing someone in an interesting way than even, <laughs> like, surviving the right. fight. You know what I mean? So, like, and... and that maybe is the spectacle of violence, you know, uh, Mercutio's way of looking at it. And then there are other characters who just don't even want to fight, like, you know, um, in, in, the, uh, in the train, well, where Mercutio kind of exhibits that, you know, he does like all this hyper-violent, you know, stuff. And then like there's uh, Gregory and Samson, you know, uh, I forget which one is about to go in. I think it's Gregory's about to run in to the train and like, you know, and then Samson like grabs his arm or whatever. And it's like, yo, this is not, don't do it. You know what I mean? Like, this is not cool. Like, um, and that was an opportunity for me to save some characters that I loved too. But also, you know, um, a chance to show that, man, like fear is real. And I think fear is a real part of violence too. Um, and disgust, you know. So I think by showing maybe, you're not gonna ever get rid of uh, violence, and I don't think you should necessarily um, benefit off of the spectacle of it or glorify the spectacle of it. I mean, maybe there's a place for that. I don't know. You know, yeah. But I think showing human, uh, showing the full, or trying to show the full range of human emotions and reaction to violence is an important part of that. Yeah. If that answers your question, I don't know. Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's happening? <laughs> um, kind of you guys were talking about or a little bit earlier about um, how you like the remix stuff within your comics, and you can kind of see that with a lot of like the different um, kind of uh, like cultures and places and aspects that you like to kind of dive into and combine in um, your work. I think that's really interesting, and especially with, um, I guess, I'm curious to hear about your um, take on kind of this conversation that's happening in our culture right now. It's a kind of a popular thing online and stuff is like the idea of like cultural appropriation oh, yeah. and what that means to you in a way that like, it's kind of simplified a lot of the time, you know, it's either you use everything and do whatever you want with it because culture is fluid or mm. you don't touch it and everyone like should segregate from anything at all, mm. and I think the conversation goes deeper than that, so I guess from your aspect of like, you know, combining Eastern and American culture and European culture, like kind of how do you, mm. what's your like, I guess, uh, philosophical yeah. take on I that? I think, I mean, what you mentioned, it is like, it's reduced way too yeah. much. And I think the other side of sort of the conversation about appropriation is like, there is a necessary, um, there's on both sides, there's a necessary like separation, separation of yourself from what you've observed in regard to like, okay, well, uh, I use a lot of, you know, like Japanese semiotics. I wouldn't even say like uh, Eastern or whatever. It's very specific. You know, like there's a um, Tengu motif in a lot of my work, right? Um, and it's actually a part of my identity. You know what I mean? Like um, I don't, I don't assume being a part of, like I wouldn't say I'm a part of Japanese culture. I wouldn't, like in the same way that I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm a part of like black culture in Ohio. You right. know what I mean? Like there's certain, there's certain elements and I'm connected to something. If it's something that's a part of who I am or if there is a way for me to use something to, uh, um, to a specific end that is not just about the exploitation of, uh, of a sort of, um, What's the word? Uh, an aesthetic, but like a uh, an exotic aesthetic. Right. So something that is uh, that hinges upon the separation of you as a human from the subject. You know what I mean? Like I, in this case, I won't. I won't. I don't. I don't use it. You know. But at the same time, it's like I'm a part of the world, and that like there are a lot of things, and I and I definitely I'm reverent to it, and I and I'm aware and I look at what I'm going to take from. In the case of Japan though, it's actually pretty personal. 
uh, like when I was in school, uh, I had a few friends and I definitely had like a, I had a long relationship and I was going back and forth. And I started to almost have like a filial connection to some folks over there. So it's not Japan as a whole, but like an actual very specific um, experience I had with a few people. Aesthetically, yes, I'm a student of a lot of Japanese aesthetics. Uh, for the simple fact that like if you're American, like one thing that's crazy is like you, a lot of people would never question sort of like what, say, France's aesthetic influence on on Americans or on culture in general. Like I have people point out things to me often about that particular thing, but not the other. And I think that has something to do with how appropriation works. And again, it, when it's ugly, it's because it, it requires that you separate yourself from the subject. This thing is interesting because it's strange, you know, because I'm not, you know, it's from another thing. I can't connect to it. It's almost like the fetishization of like, it's, how I, sex often works this way. Well, like this is different than me. And like I'm able to kind of like, I'm separate from it so I can appreciate it in a weird sort of way while remaining separate from it. I think if you appropriate something in a way that is both sensitive to what that thing actually is, meaning connecting to it by understanding that ultimately I'm human and this is a human you know, expression of humanity, I think it could be very positive. I think it can break down barriers uh, in how you think about things. Like, okay, that person has a wild piercing on their face, so like they're, you know, they're from the jungle or something, they're weird. It's like, nah, like if you could take, if you could take that and somehow show that like, you know, you tell a story where it's like, okay, wow, nah, they're human beings. Like this is just another way. It's just as strange as like, you know, how we use contact lenses or something. You know what I mean? Like I think this sort of thing is, Appropriation can be appropriate. Right. But often what frustrates me is just like when someone sees something that looks cool and they just mash it up with something else and then like, okay, yeah, that's dope. Right. It's like, all right, man, I understand like how <laughs> as a spectacle it could be uh, immediately um, sort of engaging, but I think is that worth how it alienates people who maybe have a, a, a more than superficial connection right. to what, what you're using as a symbol. Right. So like in Prince of Cats, yeah. um, part of, all right, we're all, well, I'm 37. So uh, I grew up at a time when both commercially and uh, in many ways, we, Japan was a really big part of our culture. Like, yeah. uh, started out, there were Fords. Then like over the course of like 20 years, everything was a Nissan or a Honda. Right. You know, like you have Frigidaire, but like, you know, now it's Panasonic. You know, Magnavox is now Sony. You know, like, so culturally things were changing. And Japan, you could even see like, from something like Ninja Turtles to like, there was just a big influence and it had something to do with the economic relationship. It's almost probably like, if we weren't so racist, um, our relationship to like the Middle East now. It's like right. Saudi Arabia, right? Like it's, right. you know, but we don't have any like, uh, I guess our byproducts of Saudi Arabia, like what we drive our cars, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, you know, there was, a, there was an interaction. And like, so I think also in the Western world in general, from like the French on up, like so the, you know, like the post-impressionists getting like ukiyo-e prints and stuff. I think it just informed my aesthetics. And when I started on Prince of Cats, also the first staging of a Shakespeare play somewhat was, uh, that I saw was Ron, right? When I was a kid. And so like that informed how I thought about Shakespeare. You know, like I, didn't, I don't even think I got to see a play until well after I'd seen yeah. Ron and um, right. Kumonos, uh, Throne of Blood, yeah, Throne Kumonos Blood. Sujo, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, it was just natural to me. Like, I thought it was dope. I was like, okay, well, I thought about Tybalt. I was like, Tybalt reminds me of uh, Dionosuke, right? Dionosuke was like this character in this film called, um, uh, damn, it's Daibutsu something. It's, uh, 
but it stars um it stars um oh, now I'm having like a brain but anyway, it stars like this gentleman uh who he played the main villain in both of uh Yojimbo and uh Sanjiro opposite of Toshiro Toshiro Mifune. And the cover to the book of Prince of Cats is actually a reference of um Taranori Yoko's uh poster for um uh Battles Without uh Honor and Humanity and a mashup of the film um damn what's the name of that film? And the character, Dionusuke, he finds enlightenment through violence. So he starts out as someone who's just really fixated on his ability to use his sword. And by the end of the, the story, and the film stops before it gets to the end um, of the story, it was a novel series that uh, was in like 19th century, early 20th century Japan. But this film by, I believe it's Okamoto, uh, by the end he's, he's in a complete rage and he's just killing people. And it kind of like, at that point in Prince of Cats, it's kind of like when he's in the, um, when he's in the, uh, this occurs for Tybalt when he's in the, um, the train when he's watching. And shortly after. So yeah, everything that I actually referenced is like a very deep meaning to me. Um, and I think very long and hard on it. Uh, from like the Suba, like you'll notice the Suba have, you know, the Capulet symbol on it. And also maybe like there's some fake Suba, like kind of Fulton Street. I thought about like the little details that you would see in that culture that maybe resonate to like, say to Fulton, you know, like fake Louis Vuitton. So right. I was like, oh, someone has like a fake Louis Vuitton Suba or like, you know, you know what I mean? That's awesome. So it's deliberate. And, you know, I'm totally open with people kind of like seeing that and be like, oh, what the fuck are you talking about? What do you know about that? I mean, my probably rebuttal would be most of the cultural things that I even appropriate in this no longer exist. It's like me feeling connected to like, you know, Buffalo soldiers. At a certain point, it's like, I really don't have any more, my skin, sure, but I don't really have any more uh, right to it than like anyone in this audience because we're separated from time, by time. And you're engaging with stuff that is already appropriating in its own way, to use mm. the word in a negative sense. I mean, Kurosawa was deeply invested in, in American culture and the Western and Shakespeare and he's- I actually never thought that, yeah, like I never even thought about that because I thought it was appropriate. He was, what he did with, yeah, he was, Kumo no Sujo is brilliant, man. Yeah. Like setting, yeah, yeah, taking that shit from like, what, Scotland or whatever yeah. and like setting it in, yeah, warring states, period. Like, that shit is brilliant, man. And right. it, like, actually connects, it connects me, like, I don't know. I feel like that is yeah. a connecting agent. Right. It's like, how, how different is it? You know, like, King Arthur could have been, like, you know, Yoshitsune, right? Like, just some, or, like, whoever, um, you know, like, in Italy, like, trying to unite these states. It's like, it's a human problem, and it's a very human right. thing that happens. And I think sometimes smashing that is dope, you know? Right. But, like, right. yeah, I awesome. think a model walking down a runway with like some feathers on her head is like that's a little yeah. gauche yeah it's like you know like what exactly. are you what are you saying i mean maybe there's an appropriate place for that but i don't know i haven't seen it yet yeah particularly when certainly there's not a, in the runway yeah, yeah and there's a relationship of exploitation there too exactly. you know there's a relationship of exploitation several exploitation yeah you don't yeah. get to you don't get to wipe a group out and then like just say no but we want to keep these aesthetics yeah you know, no. like i think that's something different I think about this all the goddamn time. <laughs> you may have figured that out. <laughs> Do we have time for one more? No, we, we're actually uh, we're out of time oh, right. for here, but, but then now we're going to move out awesome. into the atrium. So and, we can, uh, people can 